Thanks for listening to the show. Now we want to hear from you and give you something in return. Rate this podcast or any other Mercatus podcast on Apple Podcasts, including Conversations with Tyler, the Hayek Program podcast, and the Mercatus Policy Download, and we will select 50 people to get a signed copy of Tyler Cowan's latest book, Stubborn Attachments, before it hits the bookstores on October 16th. Just visit mercatus.org slash contest and give us your info after you submit your review so we can reach you. That's Mercatus dot org slash contest from now until october 1st welcome to macro musings the podcast series where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the important macroeconomic issues of the past present and future i'm your host david beckworth of the mercatus center we are glad you've decided to join us our guest today is brad setzer Brad is a senior fellow for international economics at the Council on Foreign Relations, where he works on macroeconomics, global capital flows, and financial crisis. Brad served as a deputy assistant secretary in the U.S. Treasury from 2011 to 2015, where he worked on Europe's financial crisis, currency policy, financial sanctions, commodity shocks, and Puerto Rico's debt crisis. He was previously the director for international economics on the staff of the National Economic Council and the National Security Council. Brad is also a longtime blogger and now regularly blogs at Follow the Money. Brad, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks so much for inviting me. Well, it's great to finally meet you in person. I've s- interacted, seen you online, I think, <laughs> almost a decade now. So it's kind of neat to finally, t- finally meet you, and you've, you've put up with my bantering online. <laughs> so it's real gracious of you to come on. And, and I know listeners have actually requested you. You've been one of the people they've requested a, a, m- many times. So think they'll look forward to hearing from you. And I always ask my guests, how did you get into economics and into macroeconomics in particular? So what's your story? And I think I am a case study for how the first job you take uh, matters. So I, I did a PhD actually in international relations. I knew I was interested in public policy. And my very first job out of grad school, first real job, was a staff economist in the International Affairs Department of the U.S. Treasury. I started in 1997. I guess I was hired to uh, track uh, the trade balance. That was sort of my narrow little portfolio. But with the uh, Asia crisis unfolding, I, uh, I, I chased the hot topic. I got myself on the Asia Financial Crisis Task Force. Huh. And then I got myself on a financial architecture working group task force, which was sort of distilling the lessons from Asia uh, for all emerging economies. Um, and in some sense, uh, that put me on a, a trajectory where I've remained. You know, the basic topics of... Uh, Watching trade flows, watching financial flows, which I really hadn't paid much attention to until I started working on financial crises at the Treasury uh, and thinking about uh, debt restructuring issues kind of have shaped most of my subsequent work. Well, that's interesting. So it was all about timing there, right? Coming uh, to the Treasury just in time for the emerging market crisis. Uh, yeah. yeah if, uh, if I'd come two years earlier, I might have been bored and left and gone <laughs> off and done something else. I mean, it, it really right. was very... Uh, fortuitous. Now, you worked with Noriel Rubini later. I know he was at Treasury too briefly. Did you guys ever overlap there and then work together afterwards? Um, absolutely. I okay. Uh, as a byproduct of my work on the Financial uh, Architecture Task Force, I actually got tasked with being uh, Noriel's Treasury Minder as he was writing the the financial crisis chapter in the economic report of the president. He had, he was at the CEA, and uh, I had very clear instructions from high levels of the Treasury Department not to allow Nuriel to unilaterally <laughs> make policy. Uh, so I was a rather severe editor, um, and I guess I succeeded because he concluded at the end of his year at the CEA that he wanted to uh, come over to the Treasury, and he was actually my boss at the Treasury for a year. Okay, well, very interesting. And I think that's where I first saw you Soon after that, when you and Noriel were, were writing together, you had some interesting pieces on global economic imbalances. We'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, but you developed a very particular set of skills. You were, again, this guy who looked at flows, who looked at balance sheets, 
kind of the go-to guy, you know, where, where are the treasuries going, where are they coming mm-hmm. from. Very interesting. And you developed that at Treasury. You're also working with, with Nouriel. Now, you were also an early blogger, right? You're one of the early cutting-edge bloggers back before it really became a hot thing. Is that right? I don't know if we were like – Tyler Cohen esque early. Uh, oh, come on, you're avant garde, right? You. I. Uh, so you know, Nuriel. Uh, I mean, actually, after working for Nuriel at the Treasury, I did did spend a year and a half at the IMF. So I did okay. some uh, some uh, behind the scenes work, um, and then I agreed to write a book with Nuriel. And we, the book came out in early 2004. More or less, we finished it in 2003. And while I was waiting for the book to come out, and to be honest, waiting for the 2004 presidential elections, uh, Nuriel offered me a little bit of money uh, to write a blog, like research assistant money, not not a salary, uh, to write a blog for his uh, global crisis homepage, which was the successor to the Asia crisis uh, okay. homepage. And so I started... Uh, a few tentative steps into blogging in 2004, and then it kind of I kind of committed to it more seriously in 2005. Well, that's pretty early though in the blogging. Uh, I don't know historical I mean, it's sort of, timeline. I mean, that's, in the that's, historical timeline, yeah, we were yeah, absolutely. you know, back in the days of calculated risk and uh, uh, some of the well, know, I think marginal revolution. Of, we, we were we were in the simple old blogs based on words with very limited graphs, yeah, right? Um, that kind of era. But it was nice because I still remember. I mean, I was, you know, in fact, I worked at Treasury briefly in international affairs too, and I was reading Nouriel's work, and then I went to academia after that. So I remember following your your work at that time. But it was one of the few blogs that was solely dedicated to macro issues. I mean, you're right, marginal revolution. Uh, my boss was blogging way back when. Brad DeLong was there too, I guess. But like, fr- I think of Freakonomics, more of the kind of applied econ blogosphere was was probably the more popular mm-hmm. form of blogging. So you were one of the few macro bloggers. So anyways, I have a, a strong kind of uh, connection to your work going back then. Okay, moving forward though, more recently you worked at the U.S. Treasury Department and also at the National Economic Council. So tell us about that. I mean, you worked... On Europe's financial crisis again, it looks like you had great timing to come in in the midst of a number of, of developments. So tell us about that recent experience. <laughs> well, actually, I I was sort of semi afraid because it took uh, six months uh, for to all the paperwork to clear before okay. I joined the Obama administration. Uh, so when I joined the Obama administration, um, I was sort of afraid that the the U.S. financial crisis had been solved before I had a chance to contribute. Okay. Um, because, you know, the key events were really uh, uh, all came, they were all very front loaded in the timeline of the Obama administration, sort of the spring of 2009. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's when I was kind of, I knew I was, uh, had agreed to join the administration, but I was being investigated and it took a while to, to find the right salary slot. It just, be, it is complicated, more yep. complicated than I realized. Um, and then when I joined, actually, I thought I was going to be working mostly on uh, China and China currency issues. Um, but then sort of in the fall, I think, of, uh, of 09, certainly in early 2010, you know, Greece really uh, kind of exploded onto the scene. And so I ended up uh, – uh, Working very extensively inside the government, both on the NEC side and then to the Treasury side, on Europe's financial crisis as it uh, as it unfolded, and I think that was probably the bulk of my, you know, kind of day to day work. And then in the second term, uh, you know, after Mario Draghi's whatever it takes, and um, you know, some of the uh, you know commitment by Merkel to support a bigger backstop through the ESM. And at some point, uh, the markets kind of turned and uh, Italy and Spanish government bonds uh, yields started to fall. And, you know, Europe was a continued to be depressed and lacking demand, but defaults, major defaults, systemic defaults, uh, big bank collapses no longer seemed imminent. 
And so then I worked on a, a broader set of, uh, of issues, you know, including some work on uh, financial sanctions, which uh, t- has turned out to be, with hindsight, probably more interesting than I recognized at the time. Yeah. And you also worked on Puerto Rico's debt crisis, which mm-hmm. is another very topical issue. So you have had a very rich experience and uh, very fascinating work. And, you know, for those of us who are following your work online, we, we noticed that void in blogging when you went to work for the government. Now you're back online, so it's fun to follow you again. But let's move forward and talk about some of the topics you work on, have worked on, and continue to work on. And one of the big themes, I think, if you look across your work is global economic imbalances. So you wrote a lot about this before 2008, and you're writing about it now. It's changed some, who the mm-hmm. key players are, what's happening. But kind of give us the the bird's eye view. What are the global economic imbalances? Who are the key players? Why should we care about them? Sure. Um, you know, uh, the basic insight between all of the discussion around global economic imbalances is that if one set of countries uh, is running a large current account surplus, there by definition will be another set of countries running a large current account deficit. Uh, the world as a whole setting aside some data issues, doesn't, you know, its current account has to balance. The current account is the trade deficit plus the the net flow of interest income and dividend income. Uh, but it, for most countries at most stages in time, setting aside tax havens, it tends to be fairly close to the trade balance. Okay. And with the uh, trade, it's sort of obvious if one country is running a surplus, uh, another country in a two-country world has to run a deficit. An imbalance for, is an indication that there is a large surplus on one side and a large deficit on the other. Uh, and, you know, the constant over the past 20 or so years has been a relatively large U.S. deficit. Uh, and when I first started working on uh, imbalances, the concern was the size of the U.S. deficit uh, and its persistence. Uh, in 2004, uh, I think the trade deficit and the current account deficit had, were in the five-ish percent of GDP range, so bigger than they are now. Uh, and at the time, and this has definitely changed, the big surpluses that were on the other side of the ledger were typically found in emerging economies. Uh, not exclusively. Japan always ran a current account surplus, but back then Europe was much closer to being in balance than it is now. And so there was talk about the uphill flow of capital. Poorer countries were financing rich countries, which raises a set of issues and puzzles. And obviously, this was the time when the big flow from China to the United States uh, sort of uh, developed. Uh, When I started, China's current account surplus was only about $100 billion, uh, which was seen as big at the time. But it uh, was modest compared to the 350 billion surplus that China ended up running in 2007. So it was a period when China's surplus kept getting bigger. Uh, Chinese bond purchases kept getting bigger. Uh, and China's surplus came at the same point in time that the oil exporters were running a really big surplus, which conceptually is a little odd, right? China is an oil importer. It's not, uh, uh, heavily endowed with natural resources, uh, you would think its current account would uh, not track that of the oil exporters. But because of the particular circumstances of that time, uh, large surpluses developed both in the oil exporters who were benefiting from China's commodity demand and in China itself. And that kind of was the, the configuration running up into the 2007, 2008, when the uh, U.S. financial system started freezing up because of mortgage risk and the collapse in U.S. demand led uh, the U.S. deficit to start to fall. Brad, let me say it this way. A a current account balance also can be seen as the uh, amount of savings a country has, whether they're they're saving more than they spend. So if a country's running a current account surplus, they have excess savings. Is that right? Absolutely. So like, so in other words, China uh, had all this excess savings flowing overseas, and it found its way into the U.S., the Middle East as well. And you mentioned the emerging markets were the big ones uh, prior to 2008. What, what's happened since the crisis? Has anything changed in terms of the big savers of the world? 
Well, I think two important things have changed. Uh, China still saves an incredible share of its GDP. Okay. Uh, its national savings rate is is close to 45% of GDP, which is just sort of off the charts. Uh, it's mind-blowing compared to what we do in America. <laughs> it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's shockingly higher than Norway, which is sort of considered the model of yeah. fiscal prudence when managing its oil wealth has ever achieved. The only... Uh, country that has matched that on a sustained basis that I know is Singapore, which is uh, a small city state organized around channeling and building up uh, national wealth. To have China match that on a global scale is sort of extraordinary. Yep. Uh, however, uh, before the global crisis, China's uh, savings rate was a little higher um, and China's investment rate uh, was a little bit lower. So China was running a current account surplus that got close to uh, 10% of its GDP. It, it was higher than 10% and then the data was revised and I think it's now lower on an ex post basis. Uh, after the crisis, China did a big domestic stimulus, started the, the credit boom. And then in a macro sense, that raised the level of Chinese investment. And so by raising the level of investment, China used more of its savings at home and has had less to export to the world. So that's, I think, uh, change A. Uh, change B, uh, actually, there are probably three changes. Change B is that the, is Europe, uh, saw a collapse in demand and Europe has structurally moved into a large current account surplus, which wasn't the case before. Uh, the Spanish housing boom, the Irish housing boom, uh, France is, it wasn't quite a housing boom, but France generated a decent amount of demand prior to the crisis. The Dutch had a little bit of a housing boom. All that supported demand inside the euro area before the global crisis. And nothing comparable has emerged as an engine of internal demand inside the euro area. So the euro area has become a, a big savings exporter in a way that it wasn't before. The third factor is that the and, – and, and I think importantly there, the distribution of the world's current account surplus has largely shifted from emerging economies uh, to advanced economies. Um, and, you know, like within that story, Korea looks a little bit more like Europe. So it's not a there – okay. there are parts of Asia that haven't followed China and have seen their current account surpluses go up. Uh, those tend to be the more advanced economies in Asia. And then finally, the U.S. current account deficit uh, fell to about a little under 3 percent of GDP. Most of the fall took place during the crisis. And then after the crisis, that adjustment has by and large been sustained. Uh, initially, it was sustained because the U.S. had a, a modest recovery. Uh, and so the, the level of demand in the U.S. wasn't uh, wasn't exceptionally strong, and the dollar was relatively weak up until 2014. Since 2014, the mechanics of the uh, fall in the U.S. deficit uh, have shifted, and the oil boom has played a much much bigger role relative to the fall in demand and the shift in the dollar. So the non-oil trade deficit is actually back up to where it was before the global crisis. Uh, but our oil deficit is, has essentially disappeared. And as a result, you, know, you combine all that, uh, our current account deficit is not as large relative to our GDP as it was. But I think you know on both sides, the surpluses are probably a little bit bigger than they should be particularly in Europe, Taiwan, Korea, Thailand, and the U.S. and maybe the U.K. have had bigger deficits than I think would be optimal. So compared to 2008 and before, have global imbalances come down? You, you mentioned the U.S. current account deficit is smaller on a sustained basis. Has someone else offset that? And if not, it would suggest that maybe some of the overall imbalances have come down or am I wrong? On no, that? no. The overall imbalance has okay. come down. Uh, the debate is over whether it has come down enough. It is, sure, it is sure. not at the sides of uh, 05, 06, 07. But 05 and 06 and 07 were kind of at a, an exceptional level. Right. It right. hasn't returned to the kind of the, the deficits and surpluses that okay. would have been typical – 
uh, amongst the major economies in the 1990s. You know, Thailand obviously had a huge deficit going into its crisis. So in aggregate, uh, clearly the global imbalance, the gap between the, you know the absolute size of either the surplus or the deficit has come down. Um, the nature of the uh, error term has also evolved. Uh, so structurally, uh, we can count more surpluses around the world than we can count deficits. But there, there has been a fall in the aggregate imbalance. Uh, and then there has been a shift in the composition. Okay. So the, the subset of surplus countries has basically gone from being all emerging markets to a couple of emerging markets and Europe, Japan, and the newly industrialized countries of Asia. All right. So if I'm looking at countries that run current account surpluses, is there like a, a rule of thumb or a number where you say, okay, their surplus is getting a little too big? Like is 3% and below okay and anything above that or is some other number you would – I mean I think 3% is kind okay. of uh, – it's a good base for our analysis. Like if it's above three, mm -hmm. the, the odds are is that it's too big. Okay. When we say too big and we say, you know, excessive surplus, the, is the implication that policy is engineering this or there's something unnatural about it? Uh, typically, if okay. a surplus is bigger than 3%, it reflects some – subset of policy choices, mm -hmm. uh, whether it is a fiscal policy that is substantially tighter than other countries' fiscal policies, which would be the classic explanation for Germany's surplus, or heavy intervention in the foreign exchange market, which is holding your currency down and supporting your export sector, or in some cases, and, you know, obviously this gets into a much more uh, political debate about values as well as uh, uh, a debate about flows, but underdeveloped social insurance systems tend to lead to higher savings, uh, and that contributes to some large surpluses. So Korea, for example, spends a lot less on social insurance than many other advanced economies, and that adds to its surplus. On the deficit side, uh, if you're borrowing a lot from the rest of the world, and in most cases, you're borrowing. It doesn't t a, a large deficit hasn't typically reflected big inflows of foreign direct investment. It has reflected foreigners lending you a lot of money, buying a lot of your bonds. Uh, some part of your economy is by definition accumulating a decent amount of debt. Uh, in general, if the current account deficit is above 3%, you tend to be – taking on debt at a faster pace than your economy is growing. It's not a hard and fast rule. Right. It's not always true. Uh, but the, the dynamics generally uh, lean in that direction. And there are often a, there's often a sector of the economy that is taking on a lot of debt. Uh, you know, for the U.S. now, it's obviously the federal government, which has a big fiscal deficit. Uh, and that's the counterpart in a sense, to yeah. the U.S. trade deficit. At various times in the past, it has been uh, household borrowing. Uh, and, you know, in the U.S. in the run-up to the crisis, you know, you have a lot of um, housing construction. Uh, a lot of that is financed by debt. You have a lot of households uh, pulling equity out of their houses by borrowing. And all that was leading to uh, higher levels of household consumption, a high level of investment in domestic real estate, and that housing exposure turned out to be the source of financial trouble, more so than the absolute size of the inflow. But I think there tends to be a correlation. If you're running a really big current account deficit, someone tends to need to borrow a lot. Uh, and uh, in some cases, more in the emerging economies, excess fiscal deficits have given rise to trouble typically when they're financed in a foreign currency. And then in the advanced economies, the uh, housing booms that have led to large current account deficits have tended to be the proximate cause of bigger crises. So in, in general, the concern is if you're running current account deficits above 3%, the, the uh, idea is, the concern is that you're running up debt. And at some point, that debt has to be paid back and maybe sooner rather than later. I mean, you know, we'll, we'll, as you guys have always argued, you know, a lot of debt doesn't necessarily get 
paid back. It's just that you're running up the stock and eventually you can't run up the stock more and you have to start paying interest even if mm-hmm. you're not paying the debt back. And the the inability to run up your debt more means a, a shock in demand. Right. Um, and then in some cases, yeah, you can't pay it back. A lot of the sw- subprime borrowers had borrowed against the uh, expected increase in the value of their home. They didn't actually have income to cover the ongoing interest expense. And then, you know, many of the subprime mortgages had features whereby the, the interest rate, uh, yeah. uh, juiced up, jumped up. And so, you know, you got, it would all sort of work as long as housing prices only went up. But when housing prices went down, the income wasn't there to service the mortgage. And then those who lent money didn't get their money back. And then the financial system. The same up. thing for the U.S. government. The concern is that you know, if they roll over treasury bills, they're going to face higher interest rates. And, you know, if all else fails, they can print money, but then you're going to create inflation if you're buying up the debt. So the concern is you reach some limit, some point. And the U.S. is unique. It's different because it, it's a reserve currency. It, it has mm-hmm. some capabilities. But we're seeing this phenomenon, for example, in Turkey right now to some extent. We'll talk about that a little mm-hmm. bit later. You've written a lot on that. I mean, Argentina right now is the best case because that's – you know, Turkey's got a lot more of the banking Mm -hmm. crisis dynamics. Argentina, the fiscal deficit is driving the current account deficit. Okay. And unlike in the U.S., Argentina finances its uh, fiscal deficit by selling bonds denominated in a foreign currency, which it can't print. And since it had been financing in dollars, it was exposed to the Fed's rate hike cycle, which is kind of the classic story. Let me ask this question then. So – What's happened in a nutshell is there's these parts of the world that are saving more than they need, Mm -hmm. than they can spend domestically or invest domestically. So it has to find a home somewhere and it finds it usually here in the U.S., which means we're living beyond our means. Mm -hmm. Now, the question is, would that have happened in the absence of these countries' policies doing what they did? For example, we mentioned in China, there was foreign exchange intervention. So, you know, the, the, the the concern is China's manipulating its currency. Even President Trump has been saying this. And I think that may be a little bit dated now. Mm-hmm. But the concern was, you know, China was trying to get some unfair advantage, manipulating its currency. Um, emerging markets maybe are more are mercantilists or trying to, you know, follow an export-driven growth strategy. So they're making their exports as cheap as possible. My question is, assume the governments did not explicitly follow those policies. So China did not manipulate its currency would we still see a high savings rate because of where China is on the development ladder and thus savings flowing out of China into the U.S.? No, I mean, that's an, a heavily debated question. Okay. Um, my personal view is that during the period when China really was intervening, when there was really a case that it was manipulating, i.e. holding its currency down, when it was adding at a spectacular rate to its reserves. So bit broadly speaking, the period from 2003 to 2013, I think there, there are smaller concerns about manipulation now, but those concerns are in specific countries, not China, Taiwan, Thailand, and make a surprisingly good case that Vietnam fits the criteria, but they're in the, the periphery of uh, China. They're around China. They're, I call it an arc of intervention. Huh, uh, but it's everywhere but China, so to speak, <laughs> right. uh, which is quite different from the world where China was intervening. My personal view is that when China at its peak was adding, counting some of its hidden forms of intervention, 15% per year to its reserves and hidden reserves, that's a big number. And I think if China had not been buying at that pace, uh, the current account surplus would have been smaller. China's currency would have been significantly stronger. So in my mind, there's very little doubt that there would have been adjustments to savings. How much smaller would the current account surplus been? So how high did it get and how small do you think it would have been had there not been this intervention? Um, so I think a, a safe low-end estimate. So China's current account surplus at its peak – was about 10% of its GDP. Which is crazy. Crazy huge. big. I mean, the only, yeah. you know, it was a little bigger as a share of G- its GDP going into the global crisis than Germany. That's still system. striking, though. 10% of GDP. I mean, that's just, it wow. was, that was It was big, right? I, mean, it, it, I think it's been revised, so now it's a little bit below. There's 
uh, there's a little bit of an air band okay. or measurement of the current account surplus sure. and how you count FDI. I can go into all the boring details. So around 10. Okay. Right? Intervention at its peak was around 15. I would confidently say that without the intervention, the peak of China's surplus would have been below 5% of GDP. Huh. That would imply a coefficient of about a third. Um, personally, I think the coefficient might be a little bit higher. And so China might have been kind of in the 2 to 3% of GDP surplus range, which is where it is now. Part of that, though, is that China ha would, without as much support from the export side of its economy, put more emphasis on domestic policies to support demand. So it's a joint equilibrium. Back when China was exports were growing at the spectacular rates, of, you know, from 2002 to 2007, one of the biggest export booms in human history, China was actually limiting the amount that companies and others could borrow from the banks. There were pretty strict limits on the loan to deposit ratio. Reserve requirements were jacked up. A lot of uh, lending capacity was bottled up inside the banking system in order to keep inflation from going up. So one of the things that I think would have happened is that without the extra boost from exports, China would have allowed more domestic lending earlier uh, and perhaps had a looser fiscal policy as well, perhaps uh, done more to develop its social safety net. And so you would have had uh, adjustments supported on both sides. You know, now I think we've moved away from a world where the uh, intervention is the main distortion to a world where uh, fiscal policy divergences are the biggest source of imbalances. Uh, you know, the U.S. has now the, by a significant margin, the loosest fiscal policy of all the advanced economies. And most, not all, but most of the surplus countries, balance of payment surplus countries, uh, also have fiscal surpluses. So Korea has a general government fiscal surplus. Uh, the Netherlands has a general government fiscal surplus. Germany famously has a uh, general government fiscal surplus and is underinvesting in public infrastructure. Sweden has a uh, uh, general government fiscal surplus. The Swiss, I think, have a small surplus. You know, Japan's the exception. Uh, Japan has uh, such a high level of corporate savings that even with a 4% of GDP, uh, fiscal deficit is still running a pretty sizable current account surplus. But by and large, right now, uh, big differences in fiscal stance are leading to big differences in monetary stance, pushing the dollar up and driving uh, current account, the, cur the, the structure of uh, global financial flows right now. Now, it's easier to think of policy responding to currency intervention. At least in my mind, it is. You know, it's easier argument to make. And even then, I think it gets tricky what you actually do in practice without triggering trade wars and, and, and you know, spillback effects. But in the case of fiscal policy, like in Germany, I just, I imagine it's got to be harder to address that, say, from the U.S. perspective or anywhere else in the world, that, you know, Germany is running this big current account surplus and it's a result of tight fiscal policy, as you said, I, I can see two arguments pushing back against doing something about that. One, you know, that's their choice. It's fiscal policy. You know, we can't force them to build more roads, make more bridges. Mm -hmm. Secondly, man, isn't that a good thing? They're, they're saving. They're, you know, they're, they're not running big deficits. What do we do as a, as a country from a policy perspective in response to these fiscal issues and these fiscal, you know, uh, critiques, I guess. And it, you're right. It's kind of hard because fiscal choices are deeply domestic. Um, I think, you know, in some ways, the strongest argument against Germany's surplus comes from its euro area trade partners. Yeah. Uh, because in the context of the euro area, there's a macroeconomic imbalances procedure. Uh, which in principle says that there's an, an obligation on the part of surplus countries. Uh, if you have a surplus, I think above 6% of GDP to try to bring it down. Uh, of course, there's a, a, a similar obligation in theory on deficit countries. Uh, but with both Germany and the Netherlands running really large surplus countries and with after the euro area crisis, the balance of payments deficits inside euro area, you know, France has a small one. No one else does. It's, it's all on the surplus side. There's an argument that uh, 
uh, these tight fiscal policies are causing your, your partners in a common currency uh, trouble. Uh, they're making it harder for countries that have depressed, still depressed levels of demand, Italy, Spain to a lesser degree now, to rely on exports to Germany uh, to power their economies uh, and create uh, internal tensions. There's also a, a conceptual argument uh, that national policy choices have spillovers. And while it is your own sovereign right uh, to determine your own fiscal stance, you know, the U.S. to run a big fiscal deficit, Germany to run a big uh, surplus, it is also uh, true that national policy choices have impacts on others. And when those impacts are negative, uh, I think it is fair for others to point that out. Uh, globally, uh, at least in my view, after the global financial crisis, most of the world has suffered from a, a shortfall in demand. And certainly there's been a shortfall in demand in the euro area. You know, euro area demand is now a little higher than it was in 2007. Uh, but that's over 10 years ago. You would kind of expect it to be significantly higher. And so that lack of demand in the euro area uh, has held back Europe's recovery, which hurts the U.S., hurts our exports, has put pressure on the ECB uh, to have uh, ne maintain negative interest rates, which pushes the euro up uh, and has some spillovers. Uh, so I think there is a conceptual case you know, that both parties in an imbalance uh, would be better off if both adjusted their policies particularly in a context where global demand is a little short, uh, putting all of the burden of adjustment on the deficit country, saying the entire problem is excessive fiscal deficits. You know, in the European context, that was Greece, you know, no, no, no. Uh, and saying surplus countries have no parallel responsibility tends to lead to a contraction in demand and slower overall growth. And conceptually, you can achieve better outcomes with symmetric adjustment. But I I take the point uh, that if you're running a fiscal surplus and paying down your debt, uh, the rest of the world's points of leverage are pretty small. Yeah, and it's a tough argument to make, you know, to that country. What about monetary policy? Why couldn't the demand shortfall be addressed by the ECB in the case of the Eurozone? running things a little bit hotter? I mean, couldn't that partially be the solution? I mean, it is. And that's clearly... But they haven't, obviously. Yeah, no, well, I mean, they, they eventually got around to loosening monetary policy. Well, but inflation is still running really, really low. I mean, well, it, okay, like, it's running really... It's, it's not meeting their target. It's not meeting right. their target in part uh, because uh, fiscal policy hasn't been helping. So when you're at the zero lower bound, uh, I mean, it's actually a little bit below zero lower bound, uh, monetary policy loses a little bit of its oomph. And so conceptually, uh, once interest rates get to zero or below zero, uh, the easiest way to get uh, the economy really going again is if you combine zero interest rates with a positive fiscal impulse. And in the euro area, there's been a negative fiscal impulse. Uh, Various countries uh, other than Germany that have deficits have uh, uh, been under pressure to reduce those deficits. And Germany has not only maintained a surplus, it's actually expanded its surplus over the past couple of years. So the without uh, fiscal policy working together with monetary policy, uh, even with relatively loose monetary policy, you don't necessarily get all the demand you need. And then monetary policy – has a different set of spillovers. It tends to put down, you know, zero interest rates tend to put downward pressure on your currency. It tends, you tend to end up relying more on the rest of the world to pull yourself along, which is very clearly what has happened with the euro area. Your area's current account surplus used to be before the global crisis, like zero-ish, maybe you know, a little bit of a deficit even when oil was high, a little bit of a surplus when oil was low. It is now closer to 4 than 3% of your area GDP. It's been a, for a big economy, that's a pretty large surplus. Um, and it has global consequences. Yeah. I, I guess this is where I would, I would push back and arguing that the ECB could have done more 
And clearly, I think it messed up in 2011 by raising rates twice in 2008. I mean, I think it definitely tightened. And, no, and I, look, I, there's zero agreement. I mean, I have I have argued that one, you know, one of my uh, favorite blog posts yeah. uh, is an argument that, you know, the, the financial and economic policy establishment uh, has been too soft on itself. And it says, well, we, we worked together and we pulled ourselves out of the Great Recession. Uh, that in practice, the ECB and the BOJ should have been doing QE along with the Fed. And in, if everyone had been doing QE together in 10, 11, 12, 13, we wouldn't be in the situation we are now where the U.S. is tightening while everyone else is easy or – maintaining a very loose stance. Policy divergence. Yeah. yeah, so the policy divergences reflected a failure on the part of, in my view, other countries to match U.S. easing. And then I would also agree that with hindsight, you know, the ECB has done more easing-wise uh, from 14 on than the Fed did in 2010. We didn't do enough either. So I think globally there was a significant error in direction not enough easing on the monetary side in the immediate aftermath of the crisis and in coordination. Uh, Europe and Japan didn't join the U.S. when they should have. Okay. Well, another long conversation related to that would be what should these central banks be targeting? And listeners of the show know I would say nominal GDP level targeting would make it easier for them. But let's move on because we have Brad Setzer here and we can talk about other things besides the appropriate target for monetary policy. He has so much interesting work to share. Well, let's move to some of the recent emerging market tensions. We, we've touched on some of the issues in China, and, and I, I want to get to the emerging markets in general. Maybe we'll come back to China because you've written some interesting pieces on Turkey recently. You mentioned Argentina. Tell us what's going on in Turkey because Turkey seems to be in the headlines right now. And you mentioned banks, um, but is it banks? Is it bad – leadership there? Is it corruption? What, what's the story behind Turkey's recent crisis? Well, it's a, a banking sector that has borrowed extensively from the rest of the world in foreign currency at relatively short terms and so has built up a quite large stock of external debt that has to be rolled over. So that's kind of the classic raw material of an emerging market crisis. Uh, that Extra borrowing in foreign currency uh, came on top of what's called a domestic liability dollarization. So a lot of Turkey's domestic deposits are in dollars. Okay. Um, and so in addition to having a large stock of domestic dollar deposits, the Turkish banks went out and borrowed a lot of dollars and euros from the rest of the world. How did they use those uh, – that borrowed money? Well – they have a lot of domestic foreign currency loans. Uh, so part of the overall foreign currency funding was lent to domestic firms. And clearly, some of those domestic firms aren't really exporters. They don't really have foreign currency uh, revenues, and there is a risk of loss. Uh, but if you look at it, Turkish do domestic dollar deposits are roughly equal to domestic dollar loans. So there was a little bit more going on. And what I think is interesting about the Turkish case is that the Turkish banks through the swap market were able to borrow dollars, say issue a five-year dollar bond, use those dollars as collateral in a swap agreement and get lira from international investors, typically on a short tenor, so three-month money, one-month money. And then they use that lira that they obtained or hedge that they obtained for to uh, finance a very rapid growth in their lending to households. So it has some parallels with advanced economies that got into trouble because of heavy mortgage and consumer credit. This lending boom uh, led to current account deficits, and that current account deficit uh, has been big, 5% of GDP or more for a long time, and then it, it increased last year going into – uh, the Fed's tightening cycle going into a period when the direction of the dollar's movement changed. So you kind of have a period of a buildup of vulnerability heavily in the banks and in the firms, uh, but also some kind of unique uh, 
uh, swap financed uh, exposures. You have a current account deficit that increased at an inopportune time. And then you have growing questions about President Erdogan's leadership. Uh, Erdogan has always been a little unorthodox. Uh, he doesn't believe uh, in particularly high real interest rates. He you know, complains about the interest rate lobby. Uh, and he just generally has wanted the central bank uh, to hold interest rates low relative to inflation. Uh, and you know, after uh, getting another term of the presidency, he put his son-in-law in charge of the economy. There's a general sense that he is – uh, eroding Turkey's institutions. And so if you combine doubts about the policy framework, a Fed tightening cycle, big dollar exposures throughout the economy and a lot of short-term debt, external debt, you just have classic emerging market crisis raw material. Yeah. So I have to mention, and you alluded to this, the Erdogan's um, fascination with what we'll call neo-fisherism. And uh, as listeners of the show will know, I've had Steve Williamson on here before, a big proponent of neo-fisherism, the idea that the central banks actually need to raise interest rates to um, get higher inflation. So Erdogan is promoting neo-fisherism in Turkey as a justification for his policies. As you mentioned, he's against the interest rate lobby. So this has been a, has been a fascinating experiment with neo-fisherism that's not turning out too well. <laughs> Conventional thinking does seem to be borne out here despite the the faddish popularity of, of with some for neo-fisherism. So I had had to put that in there. Although um, Steve Williamson told me this is not a clean, clear-cut case of uh, neo-fisherism nonetheless. So a lot of dollar liabilities, some bad institutional developments, the Fed tightening. Um, this I, and yeah, the the other factor, which is important in Turkey's case, is it's important globally, uh, is that Turkey imports oil. Oh yeah, and oil prices yes. have gone up. So you know, the the interesting thing in both Turkey and Argentina is that their current account deficits uh, spiked up a little bit, uh, even before the oil price uh, jumped this year. So uh, in seventeen. Uh, and in Turkey's case, you know, in part because there was an election, there was some quasi-fiscal spending that seems to have pushed uh, the current account deficit up, and that adds to the the doubts about the the policy framework. So, in addition to the dollar liabilities they have to pay off, they now have to somehow get more dollars to pay for the energy imports they need. So they're in a, a real bind, yep. real quandary. It was interesting. I I saw in the New Wall Street Journal today they compared. Um, Russia to Turkey, and they have this article. One of the reasons Russia has the, is not having a similar experience is because they have a central banker that Putin has given a lot of discretion to, and she has gone through and purged out really bad banks and tried to get banks, you know, to be more solvent, do better lending, and maybe in in Turkey, maybe part of the decline institutional climate of banks having more free reign and getting these dollar liabilities. I'm not sure, but it's an interesting divergence. And Russia has very low inflation. Turkey is very high inflation. But I want to step back from, from the emerging market discussion and make a general observation and question for you. One of the developments that's a part of Turkey falling apart that's affected Argentina is the Fed's tightening cycle, this policy divergence we talked about earlier and this has always been an issue, right? So in the early to mid 2000s, you know, heck, going back to the 1990s, I remember Mexico's crisis, at least a part of it was tied to the Fed raising interest rates. You know, the, the Fed has a large number of currencies that are either implicitly or explicitly tied to it. In fact, we had uh, Ethan Elzeski on the show, but he has a paper with Reinhardt and Rockoff. And they go and they try to estimate the number of currencies that are tied to the dollar loosely, strongly, any form, and they estimate close to 70% of world GDP has its currency tied to the dollar. It's a very large number. In fact, it's about where it was during Britain Woods, if you look at, at their estimates. Mm -hmm. And I, e even if that estimate seems high, the, the point is we know there's still a lot of countries, you, you follow us pretty closely, that loosely or tightly peg. So the fact is when the Fed tightens, when it loosens, it's exporting its policy to these countries – 
So what is the world to do in a place where you have what I call a monetary superpower? You know, what do you do as an emerging market? What, what do we recommend to the world as, as policymakers when you have this huge player that affects the rest of the world dramatically? And, and the other thing is, you know, the Fed's mandate is not international, it's domestic. So it, it can't be mindful other than the feedback effects it creates domestically. So any thoughts on that? I mean, I think this is going to be, you, you've probably framed a discussion topic for the next, uh, uh, three or four G20 meetings. Um, cause I'm sure a lot of, uh, emerging markets are going to be asking that question. They thought they had, uh, graduated from a world where more or less, uh, the Fed cycle was driving emerging markets fortunes. And, uh, there's been a, a, a significant uh, amount of pressure so far this year. That is linked to the hiking cycle, but also, you know, it's it's hiking plus a stronger dollar. Last year there was hiking and a weakening dollar for somewhat mysterious reasons, and there wasn't as much stress. Uh, What can you do? Um, Well, the obvious answers are uh, limit your external debt, have large external reserves. So one of Russia's sources of strength was a more orthodox policy framework. But if you go back and look at the combined foreign currency debt of the Russian government and the Russian state banks and the big Russian state oil company, Rosneft and Gazprom, it was always a little less than the foreign currency reserves of the government of Russia. Russia can still experience shocks, uh, but with that configuration of reserves and debt, uh, it's hard to see how those shocks lead to systemic defaults. There are other emerging economies that have a similar uh, buffer. A consequence of that, though, is that emerging economies need to hold a lot of reserves uh, and the, um, their capacity to draw on global financial markets to finance deficits, investment, rapid catch-up uh, to the uh, levels of living standards in the advanced world is probably somewhat crimped. The other thing which I think would make a difference, but it's hard, uh, is to limit domestic dollar deposits. Uh, so part of the linkage globally uh, comes from monetary frameworks that are based on pegs, formal or informal, so you have to follow the Fed. But part of the linkage comes from domestic savers holding their own savings in dollars, uh, which, you know, is a way you know, emerging markets think, okay, well, it's better to have dollars at home in our banks than dollars offshore that aren't helping us. Uh, but the consequence of liability dollarization is that the banks have dollars, they need to match, they need to lend in dollars. And thus, when the dollar goes up globally uh, and interest rates go up and local currencies go down, there are significant uh, domestic shocks. So I think, you know, broadly speaking, prudent management of your balance sheet, limiting imbalances, you know, no shock, but both Turkey and Argentina had current account deficits above five. So if you kind of uh, stick to a 3% of GDP rule of thumb, you're going to limit your vulnerabilities. And if you are cautious about the banking system's uh, dollar uh, exposure, and it's particularly their short-term dollar funding needs, and you can limit vulnerabilities. But it's, it frankly is still a little bit of a problem. And we, we've left aside the kind of the, the big one, which is kind of, you know, how can we exit from a world where China more or less tracks the dollar? So mm-hmm. It's definitely not full-on dollar peg. It's a basket peg. It's managed against the dollar. But it doesn't divert too far away from the dollar, right? Otherwise, it might find, uh, find problems with reserves leaving the country. Well, if you freely float, you know, you're, if, if money wants to leave, that shows up in the currency right. and your current account surplus goes up. It doesn't lead to drains on reserves. But since China doesn't freely float, uh, when the currency is going down, people will tend to expect that it will continue to go down. More money leaves. There's pressure on reserves. Yeah, I think in the long run, uh, it would be uh, helpful if China had its own autonomous monetary policy directed at Chinese domestic objectives. Kind of doesn't solve. Why all does po- it still loosely follow the dollar? 
Because if you have loosely followed the dollar for a really long time, the transition could be quite a shock. Um, and I think there are reasonable concerns that if China cut the anchor, uh, that it would be disruptive. Back in 2009, 2010, 2011, China could have cut the anchor and it would have allowed a tighter monetary policy, uh, which would probably have been good for China. That was when the credit boom was uh, really taking off. But it would have meant a uh, much stronger Chinese currency and a shock to China's trading sector. China didn't want that. And so it continued to maintain the dollar linkage, allowing some adjustments. Now, if China were to cut the linkage fully, the yuan might fall quite significantly. And that would uh, really set the president off, really uh, cause a lot of trade disruption globally. Uh, and since it's unlikely that China would really ever you know, given that most many prices in China are controlled and, uh, you know, it's not, it wouldn't just be liberalizing the exchange rate, it would be liberalizing a lot of other prices. You could imagine that in the process, China might uh, disrupt domestic uh, expectations and trigger significant amounts of capital flight. So you would get uh, uh, slightly bad outcomes in China as well. Basically, it has at any given point in time been hard to completely untether the yuan for different reasons. Now, was 2015 an example of where we saw the dollar strengthening, causing stress in China? Absolutely. Okay. So that's an example where if they tried to sever, things could really run amok pretty quickly if, if – I think that there, you know, essentially have been two broad currency regimes over the past 15 years. Okay. Um, and the breaking point was 2014 when the Fed starts its tightening cycle and mm -hmm. the ECB and the BOJ are intensifying their easing and the dollar appreciates ballpark by about 20%. Uh, that 20% rise in the dollar comes when oil prices are collapsing. And when China is in, and for its own domestic reasons, uh, a bit of a slump. Uh, so it is unwelcome. But the oil currencies that were pegged to the dollar followed the dollar up, and the yuan followed the dollar up. In 15, China concluded that it couldn't sustain that stronger yuan. And it wanted to uh, adjust the yuan down without completely moving to a float. And that, you know, pulling off a controlled depreciation, which China did. Just a little bit. I mean, it wasn't much, right? It was about percent? A 10 percent. Oh, it was 10 percent. From, from, okay. So the initial move was 2-3. I guess I was thinking about the initial one. Uh, but then that, that started a sequence of further depreciations. Uh, so by uh, mid-16, uh, the cumulative move both against the dollar and against the basket was about 10 percent, a little less. But the initial depreciation, that was the one that kind of triggered some of the financial stress. Is that right? Uh, that It was a shock because up until the depreciation, the yuan had been like totally pegged. Um, and there was yeah. a sense that China was in the run-up to get into the SCR and everything else. It would continue that peg. And so it, the, the DPEG, initial depreciation, shift to management more against the basket came as a shock. And it was seen as a sign that China wanted further weakening of the currency. And since it was seen as a sign about direction, that's just a one-off, it induced a lot of further uh, outflows. And so it, you know, China had to burn through a lot of reserves to keep the depreciation managed. Uh, otherwise, it would have floated down, and that would have been uh, uh, a bigger shock to the U.S. It would have, you know, we would have seen a much more competitive China uh, in trade markets. So, in the closing minutes that we have here, any guidance for the Fed? What happens when you have a monetary superpower? What would you tell the Fed to do, if anything? Look, I think I think the Fed is a little bit boxed in. Okay. by the uh, Trump administration's fiscal policy. Uh, we are currently doing a significant fiscal expansion. Uh, 
uh, that is pushing up demand at a point in time where you can debate whether we're at full employment or if you can never define what full employment is. But the economy is clearly in a much stronger position uh, than it was five years ago or even two years ago. Uh, and it isn't clear that the economy really needs the, the extra jolt. So I think the Fed uh, reasonably thinks that with the strong underlying dynamics of U.S. demand – uh, the U.S. needs a slightly tighter uh, policy. I do think, and I think we saw this in uh, 2015, that you know, given that the Fed has a domestic mandate, there are limits on how much it can take the rest of the world into consideration. Uh, but the the spillbacks, particularly if the spillbacks run through China, given China's size, uh, can be so significant that the Fed does have to. Uh, uh, Take them slightly into consideration. Uh, you know, in 15, a lot of different things going on, but uh, the Fed did pause its right. cycle. I don't think the conditions now warrant that. I remember in 15, the fall in oil prices proved to be less stimulative than expected because the oil investment in the U.S. fell and that more or less offset any gain to the consumer. And the dollar's big rise had a, a negative drag on trade, as you would expect. So growth in 15 was actually a little weak, and the Fed's pause was very much the right decision. We don't see that now. So that's the sense in which I think the Fed is tied. Conceptually, I do think that even a domestically oriented economy like the U.S., whose central bank has a domestic mandate, uh, does need to take into consideration uh, the ways in which U.S. policy decisions reverberate and spill back. My strongest advice, actually, though, is that, hey, I know it's hard, uh, but the current configuration of fiscal and monetary policies amongst the advanced economies uh, is wrong. Now, the U.S. is doing fiscal expansion when it doesn't really need it. Europe is doing fiscal consolidation when it should be doing fiscal expansion. That is creating a quite large divergence in monetary policy that is putting moving the dollar to a pretty strong level and that is not helping at the minimum emerging economies. So if you wanted a better global configuration of policy, it is not that hard to think of it. It's just very hard to see how you could get there. We are committed to a fiscal expansion. The Germans are committed to their fiscal policy and they really think – that France, Italy, Spain should, you know, get their fiscal house in order now that things are better. So it just doesn't seem likely to happen, but that's where kind of there's something obvious that could be done. And the casualties will be the emerging markets. Uh, old school, you know, uh, back where we started, back to 1997. <laughs> but, you know, the, it won't be quite as bad as 97 in my view. Uh, emerging market, there are countries that have weak uh, fundamentals, weak balance sheets, too few reserves, but most emerging economies have more reserves, less they external. From that experience. They've learned. So, you know, you kind of, as opposed to saying almost all of the big emerging economies have some true underlying vulnerability, we're in a world where there are specific emerging economies that have okay. very serious vulnerabilities, but you can look to some of the big guys, Russia, you've mentioned, Brazil, less clear cut, but more a lot more reserves. India, China, billion in reserves. China is a strange case. Three trillion or more. Three is trillion and a nice external loan portfolio and some money in the China Investment Corporation. But not they're an outlier is what you're saying. Well, they're, they're not short external assets, but in China, the, the concern is all the domestic debt. So I think, you know, it's, I think of China in some sense as an out, as a unique, not really fitting well with an, 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 okay. the rest of the emerging economies just because it's so big. You know, it's the same. It's within shouting distance of the euro area, a little smaller than the U.S. It's it's no longer uh, a couple trillion dollar economy. It's a $12 trillion economy. And then it's, it's particulars are so unique to China that I, I find it very hard to discuss China as in the same way that one discusses Brazil, for example. And I think China is also just a, an autonomous driver of global conditions in a way that others aren't. That's fair. It's almost an exogenous force. It, it, it is what it is. It, it sort yeah. of you wouldn't 
you know, you, we, we, we don't talk of uh, the U.S. and Europe, and the euro area, as being part of one homogenous group. We talk of them as different entities, different cycles, different policies. And I really think you now need to think of it as kind of China, euro area, U.S., and then a subset, then and a group the of emerging. The new G3. A new G3 that isn't coordinating. Yep. Okay. Well, on that note, our time is up. Our guest today has been Brad Setzer. Brad, thank you so much for coming on the show. My pleasure. Thanks. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. If you haven't already, please subscribe via iTunes or your favorite podcast app. And while you're there, please consider rating us and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the podcast. Thanks for listening.